Um, okay, lecture 10. We've gotten this far already. It's gone quick. So what are we doing today? Yeah, before we move on to the next topic, I have one last comment to make about the rattle nicotine property. I said on Tuesday that we were done with rattle nicotine, but there's one last thing I forgot to say. Well, I didn't forget, I just ran out of time. One important consequence of rattle nicotine, I have mentioned it before. If X is a Banach space, and if the dual of X has the rattle nicotine property, not X, but the dual of X. And if we take a measure space, should probably say sigma finite, just to be careful. I think it's actually necessary here. Then the isometric embedding into the dual space that we were talking about before, can't spell isometric properly. The isometric embedding, which we were calling phi mapping. Oh, I haven't said what P is. P is between one and infinity, including one. So the isometric embedding of LP prime of the dual space of X into the dual of LP valued in X is an isomorphism. And this finishes the duality discussion that I started probably back in week one, maybe week two. So this map, just to remind you, the way that it acts on a function F, so if G is in LP prime and F is in LP, then F paired against phi G is just the integral of F against G through the X, X star duality pairing. And this is the duality result for Bogner spaces that you expect to hold, at least with intuition from the scalar valued world. But for this to hold, we need that the dual of X has the rudder nicotine property. And there is a converse to this. Conversely, if you take your measure space to be simply the unit interval with the Borel sigma algebra, the vague measure, the usual unit interval, if you take that measure space and if the phi from above is an isomorphism for some p, doesn't have to be all, just as long as you've got one P for which this maps an isomorphism, then the dual of X has the rattle nicotine property. And this choice of measure space here, well, I don't want to cross it out, I want to highlight it. This choice of measure space here is obviously not unique. You can take many large enough measure spaces and you'll have this property. But if you take, for example, a finite measure space, then this map is an isomorphism all the time. You need to take a large enough measure space for this converse to hold. I think it's an exercise back in chapter one or two or something that in case the measure space is, is you know, has finitely many points. Sorry, when I said finite measure space, I should mean a measure space on a finite set, not a space with finite measure. If you take a very small measure space, essentially trivial, then this isomorphism here, this duality just holds without any assumptions on the Banach space. So if you want Bochner space duality to imply right on Nicodem, somehow you need to take a large enough measure space and the unit interval will do the job. Um, one way of interpreting this, which is nice, is the duality property for the unit interval implies the duality property for all spaces which is a nice way to think about it. You're not going to have any weird phenomena where you have duality for some rich measure spaces and not all. I'm not going to prove it. It's an exercise. And the proof is basically the same as the proof in the scalar case using rattle nicotine. Well, in the scalar case, you use the rattle nicotine theorem and not the rattle nicotine property. But yeah, you can look up the scalar proof and mimic that. It'll work with tiny modifications, I think.
And yeah, for now, that's all I'm going to say about the rudder nicotine property. We've had enough of that. We're bored of it. We can move on. Any last questions about rudder nicotine? I mean, you can always ask later, but now's a you know, natural time to do it. Okay. So I want to move on to the UMD property, but we do have one last topic I need to talk about. I keep putting off UMD so that we can get enough, you know, preparation before it. This last topic before UMD is the topic of rider marker sums or rider marker averages, which are something you really don't see in scalar valued analysis because they're not really necessary at all in scalar valued analysis. But these come up all the time when you're doing Barnack valued analysis for technical reasons that I'll eventually get to. So let's define what I mean by a rudder marker sum or average. Naturally, it's a probabilistic thing. Everything here is probabilistic. So where do I start here? I have to define a rudder marker variable. And maybe some of you have seen these before. You certainly have seen these before, but maybe not with this name. A rider marker variable is a random variable uh, which we usually call epsilon from some probability space mapping into plus minus one. So it's a nice scalar valued random variable. So it's a random variable on a probability space doesn't matter what the probability space is, but we have to call it something. And the defining property is that the probability that the variable is equal to minus one is equal to the probability that the variable is equal to plus one. And it then follows that both of these probabilities have to be one half because probability spaces have measure one. You can think of this as a random variable, which is like flipping a coin, plus one is heads, minus one is tails. That's what a rudder marker variable is. You know how these work. But what we really need to deal with are not rudder marker variables, but rudder marker sequences. So a rudder marker sequence is a sequence which we generally call epsilon sub n, and we generally index it over the whole natural numbers, but that's not important. It's a sequence of mutually independent rider marker variables. Epsilon n. And these will all be on a fixed probability space. And it doesn't matter what that space is. Of course, to say that they're independent, they need to be on the same probability space. That's how you get your notion of independence. So thinking of a rider marker variable as being the sort of random variable you get from flipping a coin, a rider marker sequence is what you get from flipping a coin countably many times, assuming all of the coin flips are independent as they should be. These are like, um, Bernoulli variables, I think they're called in probability, but they've got value zero, one instead of minus one, one. It's important here that we take the values plus and minus one. What we really want to do is think of this as a random sequence of signs. That's how we should be thinking of this, plus minus one. I'll give some examples of rider marker sequences. I'll give two. In practice, it doesn't actually matter which rider marker sequence you take, but I just want to show that you can actually take different models of a rider marker sequence. So the, the probabilistic standard definition is you take your probability space to be the infinite product of plus minus one, so to the n. So you take sequences of plus minus ones. We've dealt with this base before. You let pi n be the nth coordinate map. Actually, we dealt with this when we were doing this gambling example, betting on vectors, right? Pi n is the coordinate map. Then your sequence of random variables, pi n, 
is a Rada marker sequence. I didn't say what probability measure I was putting on here, but it's the standard one, right? Uniform probability in each factor, take the product. So these pi n's, they're a Rada marker sequence. Each pi n takes the values plus minus one with equal probability. They're mutually independent. Rada marker sequence, easy. But the example that analysts like to take, so this is the example for probabilists, and a lot of us are analysts instead. The analyst example is you take the unit interval and you consider these functions. They're called R sub n, called Rademacher functions. And R sub n of t is the sine, has to be plus minus one valued, right? So we take the sine of the trigonometric function, sine of two to the n times pi t. This is for t in between zero and one. Let's, let's get rid of the endpoints so that this is never zero. And we take n to be greater than or equal to one. The way these functions look, if you're not good at visualizing these things, and I'm not, this is the function r1. It's one and then it's minus one. Because what sine is doing is sine of two pi t is doing, you know, this. So you take the sine of that. Yeah, I guess you're going to get zero here. You have to ignore that zero. The set of measures zero, you can ignore it. Maybe I should say that Rademacher sequences can be valued in C or R or something, but you have to be minus one or plus one with, you know, probability one half. It doesn't exclude that you're maybe zero on a set of probability zero. You can ignore that. That's not important. That's R1. R2 looks about the same, but it oscillates twice as much and so on. What's this? Ah, uh, something, six, three, whatever. <laughs> it's another Rademacher function. Actually, no, it's not a Rademacher function because it needs to oscillate two to the n many times and this does it. No, no, that's R4, that's R3, Never mind. <laughs> I can't count. These are the Rademacher functions. And they come up in various contexts, but in particular, they do form a Rada marker sequence in the sense of the definition up here. And when you take the, there's a natural isomorphism between this probability space and that probability space, and these are the same sequences, just viewed in two different ways through that isomorphism. Yeah. But you don't have to think of that. Yeah, so when you think Rademacher sequence, just think random sequence of signs, plus or minus one, with nice independence properties. Okay, so that's a Rademacher sequence. And we actually are doing Barnack valued analysis, so we need to bring in a Barnack space somewhere. Given a Barnack space X, a Rademacher sum, or what I'll write here is a, a finite Rademacher sum. What's a finite Rademacher sum? It's an X valued random variable of the form like this. It's a sum from N from zero to some capital N because it's a finite Rademacher sum. You take a Rademacher variable and a vector XN. So this is mapping omega to X where omega is the probability space on which the Rademacher variables live. So let me quantify that where epsilon n is a Rademacher sequence. And where xn is a sequence of vectors. So our sequence in x, right? That's a finite Rademacher sum. You've got a sequence of vectors and you sum them up with a random choice of signs out the front. 
So each of these is like, you know, sum of n of plus minus one of xn. And the plus or minus depends on what the Rademacher variable is doing at a particular point of the probability space. So this is a random variable. It's mapping omega. And this sum or the random variable, I should say, this random variable, it does depend on the choice of Rademacher sequence. And that's a little bit funny if you're not used to probability because you're thinking, okay, if I have a sequence of random signs and the probability is one half for plus or minus and they're independent, you essentially only have one way of doing that, right? You shouldn't really think that there are different ways of taking an infinite sequence of coin flips. But as these examples show, you can construct different models of such a process and any random variable you build out of that is gonna depend on how you built that process. You see that in particular here, this is a function on omega, right? And if you take a different probability space, it's a function on a different set. Or if you do something like, say you take a Rademacher sequence, this is a little sub example. If you take a Rademacher sequence epsilon n and you transform it, so you replace every epsilon n with an epsilon tilde n, where epsilon tilde n is either plus or minus one of epsilon n just arbitrarily right? This is another Rademacher sequence and it's a different one, potentially. If I look at the Rademacher functions, for example, and I redefine R1 so that instead of looking like that, it looks like this. This is still going to be a Rademacher variable and the sequence is still going to be a Rademacher sequence. It doesn't break any of the independence properties or anything like that. The sequence has changed. And the corresponding random variable here would also change. So even though you think there's only really one way to flip a coin infinitely many times, you can use different models of that and you'll get different random variables. So these Rademacher sums here will also change. This seems like a stupid observation. I have to be honest, it sounds like this is pointless, but this is actually really important. <laughs> we'll see why. Tim's nodding his head because he knows probability. <laughs> He gets this. Right. So this random variable does depend on the choice of Rademacher sequence. But, but we also define what's called the Rademacher average. Which is the following quantity. You take your Rademacher sum from above which is a random variable valued in X. You take its pointwise norm, which is now a random variable valued in positive reals, non-negative reals. And then you take the expected value of that over omega. So just to write that explicitly for the non-probabilist, this is an integral over omega of this norm here, epsilon n of the variable omega, vector xn, integrate with respect to the probability measure. And this thing here, this is independent of the choice of Rademacher variables, independent of the Rademacher sequence, as long as the epsilons do form a Rademacher sequence. This is an exercise in the notes. And if you think of it the right way, it's not a difficult one. But what's happening here is that your choice of Rademacher sequence, you have different choices of Rademacher sequence, but they all have the same distribution in a probabilistic sense. And whenever you integrate random variables like this, it only depends on the distribution. So your Rademacher sums you define up here, they'll all be different for different Rademacher sequences, but they'll all be equally distributed. And your expectation here is just gonna see that distribution. So what this is telling us and what we're gonna exploit constantly is that when you're dealing with a Rademacher average like this, and we will have to deal with a lot of Rademacher averages, 
you're free to change your router market sequence. And this is surprisingly handy. You can do a lot of tricks with this. It, as I said before, it sounds like a stupid observation, but this is this can be exploited quite deeply. So just to give a little bit of intuition as to what a router market average is, if you think of a, a sum of your vectors x, n with some random pluses or minus ones, you'll get different vectors depending on your choice of signs. And you can look at all of the possible choices. Like the norm might get large or get small. Like if you take, say, the vector, you know, 0, 1 in R2, and you also take the vector 0, 1 in R2, you take these two choices of vectors. If you look at 0, 1 plus 0, 1, or you look at 0, 1 minus 0, 1, what's the norm of this? This is, you know, 2. The norm of this is 0. Like if you take dip vectors in different directions and you add them with different signs, you'll generally get different norms. What a router market average does is it considers all of those norms over all possible choices of signs and it takes an average. This, yeah, it will become more apparent why you'd want to do this, why this is meaningful and so on. But taking these random sums can somehow tell you some information about the geometry of the space you're working in, in a subtle way. Consider, for example, just another maybe more interesting example than this one. If I take two vectors x and y that are in a Hilbert space so that we can talk about orthogonality. And if x is orthogonal to y, so like your x looks like this, your y looks like that. then x plus y is this vector and x minus y is that vector. And they've got the same norm, yeah? By taking random choices of signs in front of these two vectors, you're not gonna change the norms at all. But if you had non-orthogonal vectors, you could use this cancellation or lack of cancellation that comes from taking different choices of signs to say something about how non-orthogonal the vectors are. And in a Barnack space where we don't have a notion of orthogonality that's really meaningful, taking these random sums will somehow give us back some of the orthogonality that we were missing by not being in the Hilbert space. We'll see examples of how this is used. Okay, have I lost everybody yet? <laughs> Everyone okay? Good. Rider market averages are somehow gonna, yeah, let us do Gilbertian arguments when we're not in a Hilbert space, and that's very useful. So let's move on to a, some actual math. The first theorem of the day, and this is a really nice theorem, which is not too hard to prove. This is the Kahan contraction principle. I'm not going to give the sharpest version of the theorem. I'm just going to give one that's good enough for us. Oops. So this theorem says there exists a constant C. This constant C is less than or equal to two. We know what the sharpest constant is, but I'm not going to prove it. Such that for all Barnack spaces X, for all natural numbers N, and for all finite sequences of vectors in the space X, and also for all, a lot of falls here, for all finite sequences of scalars. So this is in the scalar field, which is either real or complex field. If you take a Rada marker average, I should also say for all Rada marker sequences, finite ones going up to N, I'm usually going to just not say when we we have an arbitrary Rada marker sequence because everything I say should work for all Rada marker sequences. So what am I want? What do I want to say here? If I take a finite Rada marker average and I put in these coefficients a n, so not only do I have a random choice of signs, but I also have some coefficients 
in the sum. Then this is less than or equal to the constant C times the maximum modulus of the scalars times the Rademacher average without the coefficients. And the way you should think of this, an analogous statement for just purely for scalars, which is actually equivalent to this when you take X to be the scalars. If you imagine a finite sum, in fact, it doesn't even need to be finite. If you imagine a sum of the form a n b n, where everything is just scalar and you take its L2 norm, this is less than or equal to the L infinity norm of A times the sum without the coefficients. This is an analogous statement of similar form and it's yeah actually equivalent. So this is a bit of evidence that should make you think Rademacher averages behave a little bit like L2 norms. They behave a little bit Hilbertian. Let's prove this. And this may well be my favorite proof of the course. This is just a nice proof. This proof exploits the fact that we're free to choose different Rademacher sequences, as I was saying before, without changing the Rademacher average. So first, we do it in steps. First, let's suppose that the coefficients a n are all plus or minus one. Yeah, for all n. So instead of taking an arbitrary sequence of potentially complex coefficients, let's just take pluses and minus ones. Then if we take our, our finite Rademacher sequence that we're working with and we replace the Rademacher variable epsilon n with a n epsilon n. As I said before, this is a Rademacher sequence. Because multiplying every one of these random variables by plus or minus one doesn't change the probability of it being plus or minus one. It's just, it will be minus one instead of plus one and plus one instead of minus one, if you have a minus there. And this doesn't affect the independence at all. The epsilon n's are mutually independent and flipping them all by arbitrary sign doesn't change the independence. So this is a, another Rademacher sequence. And since Rademacher averages don't depend on the choice of Rademacher sequence, this Rademacher average is equal to this Rademacher average. So when all of the coefficients are plus or minus one, you actually have the equality of Rademacher averages, not an inequality. So the statement's actually, I wouldn't say trivial, but obviously true in this case. So that's the case of plus minus one. Now, second, let's take, uh, let's suppose that all of the ANs are, are real. They could be complex if we're working over a complex Banach space, but for now, let's just take real coefficients. Suppose that the, the coefficients are real and that they're all between minus one and one. And by rescaling, we're actually free to do this. If you had the, the sequences, okay, it's a finite sequence, so it has to be bounded. You can just rescale them all and make them all between minus one and one, all right? So let's consider this case. So let's, con you know, we're considering this case, the vector a, which is just a n from n from zero up to n because we're working with finite sequences. This is contained in R n plus one. And it lies in the hypercube with vertices or corners, maybe I should say, in this set V. So the set of corners of the hypercube are the vectors V of the form V0, V1 up to Vn. 
such that Vn is in plus minus one for all n. We're all cool with n-dimensional geometry here. This is the, the hypercube in Rn plus one. Its corners consist of the vectors that are plus minus one, right? And the hypercube is the convex hull of its corners. You can see this pretty clearly in three dimensions. It's not really any harder in n dimensions once you know what a convex hull is. Hypercube's the convex hull of its corners. Therefore, there exists some numbers, lambda v over all v in the set of corners of the hypercube. These numbers are between zero and one and they sum up to one. And they are such that the vector A is the following convex combination of the corners of the hypercube. That's what it means to be in the, the convex hull of the corners, right? So what does this let us do in terms of the Rademacher average? We're looking at this, this average here. Now we can use that A is the convex combination of the vectors V, which in particular means that A sub N, just taking projections, is the convex combination of V sub N, where V is, so runs over all of the corners of the hypercube. So we can write that here in this average. Replace A N with the sum over the vertices lambda v, vn, xn. And then we can use the triangle inequality just naively and take out the sum over the vertices. Uh, we should really have an absolute value here, but every lambda v is positive or at least non-negative, so we don't need to do that. And here we have epsilon n, vn, xn. Where now what we're looking at is Rademacher averages where these coefficients Vn correspond to vectors V that are the corners of the hypercube. And these corners have the property that Vn is always plus or minus one. And we know how to deal with those Rademacher averages because that was the first case. Lambda V Rademacher average without the coefficients. Let me just make a note here. This is equal to plus or minus one. That's what lets us do that by the previous case. And now we see that this Rademacher average is independent of the vectors V. So we have a sum and a Rademacher average and this sum is equal to one. That's how we set up those coefficients. So we have the Rademacher average with that coefficient there, which was our goal, at least for, for real coefficients between minus one and one. Oops. And as I said before, by rescaling in general for real coefficients, your Rademacher sum is bounded by the maximum absolute value of the coefficients times the Rademacher average without coefficients. And that's for real coefficients. The final case is for general coefficients that are potentially complex. And you just take real and imaginary parts. And the proof just follows because you split into two sums. You just use a triangle inequality naively. You get a constant two out the front. But recall that I said in the statement of the theorem, there exists a C less than or equal to two such that this holds. 
So what you can say just to refine this a little bit, if the ANs are plus minus one, then this is an equality. Um, if the ANs are all real, then this is true with constant one. And if the ANs are possibly complex, then this is true with constant two. That's not sharp, but that's good enough. I will tell you that the, the optimal constant C is pi on two, but you need a different proof for that. Uh, you need a, a, a smarter proof than what I did here. This is some sort of naive, but still sort of deep basic convexity proof. And when you want to do this sort of convexity proof over the complex numbers, you have to kind of exploit that the complex numbers has some geometry besides just being, you know, two, you know, real part, imaginary part, you can do something better and get pi on two, which is interesting in its own right, but we're not going to need it. So I'm not going to prove it. I'm just, we're fine that there's a constant C. It doesn't even matter that it's less than or equal to two. It could be a million for all I care, but it's finite. Okay, so before I move on, I want to just go back to the statement of the contraction principle and I want to highlight it because this is incredibly important for a lot of computations we're going to have to do. And whenever you see a Rademacher, a Rademacher average and you need to compute something with it, you should always think to yourself first, can I just use the contraction principle here? Can I get away with that? Is that good enough? And often it is. This is just... Yeah, this is a foundational thing for Rada marker averages. You need to know this theorem. You don't have to remember the proof, but it's not a hard proof to remember, I guess. So great if you do. Is everybody okay with that theorem? Or it's proof? Good. So let's, got a little bit of time before the break. Let's use it. I'm gonna introduce some notation that is completely standard in harmonic analysis and seemingly not so standard everywhere else. I could have been using it since the start of the course, but I didn't. And now I reach a point where it's gonna get painful if we don't have this notation. A less than or squiggle B. <laughs> I think half the audience knows what this means and the other half maybe doesn't, or maybe more than that. In tech, this symbol is less sim. And you get to the point where harmonic analysts will say a less sim b. What does this mean? This means there exists a constant c less than infinity independent of any parameters or functions appearing in A and B. So A and B are expressions, which are generally going to represent positive real numbers. And this C is such that A is less than or equal to C times B. That's what this less sim symbol means. Who hasn't seen this before? raise a hand or do the little raise hand function in the Zoom or something. A couple of people haven't seen it. Okay, so it's good that I introduced it. Well, I've when seen you read... it before, but I've seen it slightly differently. I've oh, seen, you've seen it independent of any relevant parameters. Or oh functions. yeah, relevant is if you want to be really harmonic analysis -y because sometimes it will depend on Which one of, of the course parameters, it's but it's not relevant. <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's a small criticism, not to you, but to the use of this, because yeah, really yeah. one ought to be always clear which parameters it depends and which it doesn't. Yes, I it think. should always be clear from context which yeah, parameters hopefully. it depends on and which parameters it doesn't. But I remember when I was a, a younger student learning harmonic analysis, this bugged me all the time. And I'd always think, how do I know which parameters are relevant? Like, how do I know? And eventually you do know from context, eventually it is clear. <laughs> from the right. statements or whatever but yeah so I should, independent yeah. of any parameters except the ones that depends on yeah exactly so if you want to be more careful you can write a less sim sub p for example b 
to mean that C might depend on P. Yeah, or, you know, you can put more parameters like that, you know, maybe it depends on the Barnack space X and some P's and Q's that appear somewhere. Maybe A depends on P and B depends on Q, right? It will eventually become clear from context if we don't know it. So I can write up here when we did the contraction principle. The contraction principle says that when you take a sum, write a marker average with coefficients, less sim without the coefficients, right? You can write that, you can ignore the C, you can say there exists some constant, I don't care what it is. It doesn't depend on the X's or this X or A or N, right? It doesn't depend on any of those things. It's pi on two, right? Or it's two. And yeah, you particularly use this notation when you don't care what the constant is. Or when you only care on maybe how this constant depends on a particular parameter, P, for example, you might have something like A less sim P squared B, where there's some P lying around that the constant depends on. And so maybe you have, maybe the constant is actually 1 million times P squared, right? But you don't care about that million, you just care about the P dependence, for example. This notation lets you just write the things you care about and you know, ignore everything else. It also means you can do a chain of inequalities like this, A is less sim B, less than or equal to C, less than or equal to D, less sim E. And if you were to write this in full, you'd have like A is less than or equal to some constant times B, and that's less than or equal to that same constant that I didn't care about times C. And I'd have to keep that constant I didn't care about in every line. And then here I'd have to put another one in. <laughs> and I have to keep carrying them line by line and that gets really tedious. So you can just chuck in a less sim and it lets you forget about it. Yeah. Last notes on this notation, because that's not actually everything. Uh, you write A equals sim B. Sometimes you put the, the squiggle above the line. I don't actually know which one I do because I do it without thinking. This means A less sim B. B less sim A. So there's a constant C such that A is less than or equal to CB. And there's another constant D such that B is less than or equal to DA. And what this is saying is that A and B are equivalent because of course A and B are expressions that have some other parameters in them, right? So what's an example of this? I might say something like N squared is equivalent to, I don't know, three N squared, right? for all n greater than or equal to one, something like that. Just to come up with a stupid example off the top of my head. So I don't care what that constant is. I could ignore it. We'll see better examples as we move on. Actually, this contraction principle here, this actually should take that form with an equivalence because you have the left-hand side controlled by the right-hand side, but you've also got the right-hand side controlled by the left-hand side by the same proof. But actually, in this case, you should include the oh, maximum of the ANs, it's not right? It's not true. Yeah, this should be maximum. Yeah, I forgot the maximum. Let's say that all of the ANs <laughs> are equal to one. Oh, but then you have equality. Okay, I've written something stupid. Yeah, you don't have that lesson yet. Max AN. And then it's right. And if you have maybe an infinite sequence of ANs and you also know that it's bounded below away from zero, then you have the other direction as well because you have to invert the ANs to, to do the other direction. Yeah. Okay, now we can have a break. Now that I've talked about that bit of notation, this is gonna be, we're gonna use this notation from now on. It's gonna simplify our lives quite a bit.